Um, so I, I wanted to just uh, add a couple of things to uh, the panel. Um, I'm, I live in Chicago. I've, I've, I used to live in New York. I actually used to live down the street um, for several years. But I've lived in Chicago for uh, the last decade. And when we started the meeting, it was about how, you know, Nithya talked about different places where uh, this kind of um, police terrorism, I would call it, um, has been happening. And, you know, in Chicago, you talk about the uh, emergence of what feels like a police state in black um, and Latino communities in the city is demonstrated by, you know, in 2011, uh, the Chicago police shot more than 60 uh, black and Latino um, people. Uh, well, 87% of those who they shot uh, of the 60 were black and Latino. Um, of, in terms of what you know they do to, to young people, uh, 20,000, the Chicago Police Department arrested uh, 20,000 um, black teenagers, um, so people under 17, compared to the arrest of 953 uh, white teenagers. So the sort of, you know, and you could go on in any city in the United States and they have their own sort of horror story of uh, statistics that sort of bear out what uh, the police state for black America um, and for Latinos looks like in this country. Um, and I think that the entire country and, you know, indeed the world got an education about what policing in the United States looks like. Um, when the police went on a rampage in the fall um, in their efforts to shut down uh, the Occupy encampments um, across the country. Riot gear, tear gas, concussion grenades, you know, you saw the sort of coming together of uh, the militarization um, of the police and the sheer sort of brutality um, that is sort of everyday policing um, in the U.S. But, you know, even with that sort of... Uh, uh, global uh, or national example for everyone in this country and the world um, to see, we know, or we should know, that it's the abuse that happens in black and Latino communities where police departments make their money. That's where the bread and butter, uh, uh, that's where that um, uh, comes from. And, you know, I don't think that we need to go through um, a, a list of statistics about the our criminal justice system uh, to sort of get a picture um, to get a picture of that and in many respects the criminal justice system is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what could be construed as a war um, on black in America in particular if you you know in terms of unemployment the rates of unemployment uh, uh, the rates of poverty 40 percent of black children live in poverty the attacks on public education and our access uh, to public education, the disparities in health care, on and on and on down the list. Every measure of, of the, the quality of life in the United States, there's a huge disparity between where the rest of the United States is and where um, African Americans in particular uh, uh, fall. And so there is a direct correlation, I think, between that and the rising levels of police harassment um, and brutality. Mm -hmm. In other words, in Chicago, there's no coincidence that Chicago has the highest youth unemployment in the United States on the west side of Chicago. It's 53%. Um, and Chicago also uh, um, has, you know, the, the high right, rates of police arrest, but also the highest rates of youth murder. And so when we talk about, like, why is this violence happening, you know, um, among youth of color, uh, directed at each other, it comes out of a sense of complete and utter hopelessness. When you know that the society could not give a damn about what happens in your life, you have, in, you know, the, the, the most gross example in, on the west side of Chicago, there's literally a, a elementary school, it's 100 years old, one working bathroom in the basement, that all the children are taken down to the basement once a day um, and, you know, parceled out toilet paper. And across the street is a brand new juvenile uh, uh, prison facility. So you know that, you know, your life really doesn't mean much. They don't, you know, you, you're handed toilet paper out at school, and the, the, the prison across the street, the juvenile prison across the street, is brand new. 
And so out of that sort of, of hopelessness, you know, comes the sort of violence that is directed at each other because people don't see anywhere else uh, 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 to um, uh, uh, direct that. And so those, those two things coincide with each other. But and more generally speaking, the rates of police violence and incarceration and attack coincide with the absolute uh, uh, repression um, of African-American uh, communities. So that when the, the majority of people, black people in particular, are not allowed to engage in what, you know, many people have come to understand what the American dream is, whether that means you get a good job, you have the ability to go to college, that your kids will do better than you uh, uh, have done, that you can own your own home, and you know, retire. You know, that is something that's becoming less, you know, of a possibility for the majority of people. But if you're black, there's no illusion for the vast majority of African Americans that you can even engage uh, uh, in that. And what they, you know, what they, uh, uh, their reaction to that is to essentially contain um, and repress it. It is basically a way to discipline, demoralize uh, uh, a population, and repress a population. Uh, really, whose explosive history um, in the United States has always been a concern for the American uh, uh, for the American state. That essentially the police are here to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. And what is the status quo for African Americans? Even if you look through a chart through the 20th century, when black people left the South en masse uh, in the 19 teens through the 20s up into the 1970s to come to the urban North. What people popularly referred to when they were coming from south to north as the land of hope. When they got to the so-called land of hope, the Harlems, the Chicagos, the Clevelands, the Philadelphias, on and on and on, what they <coughs> came to immediately realize is that the hope and expectations of what would be a better life immediately clashed with what uh, the reality was, which was a different kind of racism that may not have been enshrined in law, but that it meant that you lived in the worst housing, even though you paid more for it, that the housing was substandard, rat infested, that you went to the, that you got, if you were able to get a job, that it was the worst job possible, that you were hired last uh, uh, and fired first uh, whenever there was any economic uh, uh, question that came about that the schools that you went to were segregated and underfunded, so on um, and, and, and so forth. And the way that that system was held together was through police violence, intimidation, and harassment. This is nothing new. And that is why <coughs> Harlem exploded in 1935, Harlem exploded, and Detroit exploded in 1943 because the new wave of migrants who came for a better life uh, uh, were outraged, horrified, and angered um, by the persistent uh, reality of racism and its continuation uh, um, in the in the north. And the